Today on The Daily Charge, young upstart company Apple Incorporated showcased some promising new prospects in the smartphone, smartwatch, and home entertainment fields. We're breaking down prices, features, and looking ahead to the next innovations. Good morning and welcome to CNET's Daily Charge. It's Wednesday, September 11th. I'm Ben Fox Rubin. I'm Joni Salson. And here are today's stories. Okay, so after months of rumors, leaks, and speculation, Apple revealed its new iPhone 11 Tuesday. It starts at $700. It has an upgraded camera and processor. But beyond those headlines, there's really not much else to encourage customers to storm Apple stores to buy it. So, Joan, this event wasn't expected to offer much as far as new iPhone innovations. Do you think those expectations were pretty accurate? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. <laughs> Podcast over. I mean, one of the things that um, is most innovative is a kind of artificial, but it's like the price is the fact that yes. like it's a little bit cheaper than like what you would expect considering they have been tapping those prices so high. Right. The idea that like the mass availability phone, the ones being pegged as being the one that's for you know the general consumer, isn't like a bazillion dollars. There are those pro phones, but they're kind of being pitched as being really for like. They even say pro. Yeah. They even say pro as opposed to what they were saying last year, which were it was the iPhone XS and the XS Max. Obviously, the Max gives you some sort of indication mm -hmm. that this is for more pro users, but they took both of those and basically made them pro phones. I would assume with the expectation that everybody was buying the 10R. The 10R last year was priced at $750. Right. This year, the iPhone 11 is priced at $700. Right. When was the last time Apple actually lowered prices? They That's lowered great, price. That's a great question. Right. By like $50 this time for their entry level phone. Because they saw the folly in what they were doing. I mean, everybody, all hand, handset makers are having difficulty getting people to buy these phones when there's not a lot of new things you can do with a phone other than stick a more powerful processor slap and on more some cameras. better cameras right. and give it a little bit better battery life. That's really all anyone can do. And that's all that Apple's doing here. But at least they're not doing it and being like, also, we'll take another extra hundred dollars this time around. OK, but don't you think they were doing that in previous years? And it didn't work out. It's true. It's People true. aren't buying the iPhone. Their like they iPhone, used to. their iPhone business has been declining. They still make billions upon billions of dollars, and they're the envy of the entire smartphone industry. But at the same time, it does appear to me, if you you know read through the tea leaves here, the writing on the wall is Apple realized they needed to restrain their prices uh, with mm -hmm. the Pro and the Pro Max. This year, the prices stayed the same. They stabilized from last year as well. So yeah, okay. Beyond the price, let's talk about the features. But you're right. You're right. Absolutely. The price was really the most interesting part. So night mode, this is kind of um, catch up to uh, the Google Pixel. Right. What did you think of that? They, they were cool. really emphasizing. Yeah. How <laughs> magical it is. I mean, these things, they all look good. Except for slow fees. Slow fees I was about to get the slow fees. <laughs> what did you think of that? I mean, it's fine. <laughs> I like slow fees. I like slow fees more than the talking poop emoji thing right. from previous years. So like right. I could I could dig a slow fee. Come on, it doesn't oh wait, it does talk, doesn't it? I was I gonna say it doesn't so. talk. Yeah. It doesn't talk, Ben. Come on, give them some credit, but no, it totally does. Uh so uh what some of the new colors. I, I hate mentioning new colors, honestly, I mean, because like the candy that's colored not an iPhones were it's not innovation, but it's something that is appealing. People like that. It was something that people really liked about that series when they had that out. Okay, and the other element is with the Pro phones, uh, longer battery life. Yeah, so and with the Pro phones, you get those, you get the three cameras rather than the two, so that you have not only the wide angle but the telephoto. Another reason why people that are serious about shooting video and shooting photos would be maybe more interested in upselling themselves to that. Yeah. So Scott Stein, our heroic phone reviewer was at Apple's headquarters for this event. Let's check out some of his first impressions for the iPhone 11. So what you're looking at here is the battery life gains, the case, extra durability claims for water and for glass strength. And it's the camera, 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 camera. How good is the camera? Oh, and by the way, that front facing camera can do slow-mo selfies now and has a wider area to look at. Well, we'll see. Night mode, which also looks fantastic, is not unique to this. In fact, it's also on the iPhone 11. And that's the question is, do you maybe want to get the iPhone 11, which starts at $699, includes the same A13 Bionic chip, 
It's an aluminum design, still sports really good battery life, it seems, and it only has the wide and ultra wide camera, not the telephoto. We're not gonna know the Okay, so I also want to jump to Apple TV Plus. So yeah. while the iPhone 11 was kind of a snooze this time around, <laughs> and we were kind of expecting that to happen, Apple TV Plus, the announcement there was that it was going to be coming out November 1st. Right. $5 a month. And also, if you buy new hardware from Apple, you get uh, the first year free. Right. So, Joan, is this a compelling offer when you compare it to com the competitive set? Well... I mean, there's nothing more compelling than free. And that's sure. about how much Apple should be charging for this service in the sense that they're they're going to have nine things to watch when it launches, like nine. These, OK, to be fair to Apple, these do seem like high spec shows. Like, sure. I don't know how cool C is going to be, but at the same time. That's the thing. Nobody does. No, Apple's never made programming before. They've hired like smart people. They've cast really big stars, and they're throwing a lot of money at it, which is, you know, some of the ingredients that generally can help you get a really good show. But they're not going to have a lot of them. They aren't going to be releasing them all at once. So if you do want to watch the whole thing, you're either going to have to buy an Apple product to get that free subscription, pay the $5 month subscription, or wait till they all come out, and then have the seven-day free trial that they're actually going to have for everybody. Right. So uh, I think it's pretty safe to say that there's been a lot of skepticism in the marketplace that Apple TV Plus is really going to make significant waves, right? Mm -hmm. Especially when there are a lot of competitors that are coming out uh, to go up against uh, Prime Video, Netflix. So I, I, I don't want to say they're dead in the water or anything like that. No, but no. I mean, people are going to watch it for sure, especially if they're giving it away for free as a little bonus perk for all these new iPhones that people are buying. In addition to, you know, during the holiday season when people buy Apple TVs for friends and family and themselves, there's going to be people that just get it for free. And so, of course, they're going to watch it. I don't think it's going to be dead. And, you know, maybe they'll have big hits. It's just difficult to see why people that aren't prompted by getting it for free and aren't super fans of one of those particular actors like Reese Witherspoon or Jennifer Aniston or Jason Momoa, it's hard to see how there's going to be a mass audience unless they really like find lightning in a bottle and get something that's ridiculously popular yeah. and buzzy. Yeah. Never, cap never count Apple out. That's always an important thing to remember. But at the same time, yeah, they, they do have quite a, uh, quite a tough road going ahead with this one. Okay, so we're about to get to the Q&A section of the show, but first we've got an interview between our own Roger Chang and Ian Greenblatt of J.D. Power. Check it out. Well, Ian, thanks for joining us. Um, I just, just kick things off, I mean, the price of the new iPhone is roughly $1,000. The iPhone XS Max is $1,100. You know, you're, you're looking to pay upwards of, you know, $1,300, $1,400 if you really want to bump up the specs. Like, have phone prices just gotten out of hand? What, what, is, what does some of your research say? Well, of course, the, the phone prices are what the market will bear. And Apple sells millions and millions and millions of handsets each year. So the market is bearing the increased price on those handsets, specifically on, on the larger handsets, the bigger battery handsets, the larger screen handsets like the Macs. Uh, but the market's bearing it. Now, the... The price increases are certainly making the handset replacement cycle longer, um, and th we've seen that a lot. People are holding their phones much longer these days, uh, over 18 months, which is which is longer than uh, previously. Yeah, and that's a that's a great point, particularly this year, because I feel like even if you're a hardcore Apple fan, um, you know this may be a year where you you look to kind of hold off, because if you just sort of look ahead to 2020. You've got 5G around the corner, at least the rumors of 5G coming to iPhone. You know, what, what is sort of the, what's going on in the mind of a, of a, you know, an Apple fan or really just any kind of smartphone consumer looking to weigh the decision between buying a phone now versus waiting a year to get, uh, get potentially 5G access? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, it's all about 5G and consumers are really concerned about that $1,000, $1,100 mistake. Um, they're concerned about buying a pricey device, unable to take advantage of the latest technologies like 5G. Now that carrier problem as well, that's a carrier problem as well, because but it's something they're aware of and are marketing to. Think again of the Apple upgrade plan where you exchange your phone and pay a bit of a premium 
in the forty to fifty five dollar a month uh, area in order to upgrade that handset yearly and it eliminates that concern now for the iphone 11 uh, specifically like you just mentioned we've got 5g on the horizon and we've got a device that by all accounts and again these are just rumors and that we haven't held the handset in our hands yet um, won't be 5g capable and now now that's obviously going to put some money back in people's pockets uh, when they were ready to buy i don't know if you if you recall and and, and i'm obviously dating myself by talking about it but Back in the day when the first Android 3.0 tablet was out, uh, Android 3.0 was Honeycomb, if you can remember back that far. So the H uh, in Honeycomb for Android 3.0, that was a 3G tablet, the Motorola Zoom. It shipped with 3G modem hardware. And when it went to market, it went to market with the promise that if you send it back to us in the next few months, and I believe it was four months, that... Motorola would replace the modem hardware in it with 4G hardware. Now, as a selling point, these tablets, this is quite some time ago, this is seven years ago, the tablet price point was $800, and that was expensive. Uh, so they didn't sell a whole ton, and they didn't sell a whole ton for those two reasons, a high price point, which, again, we're seeing today, sort of reminiscent of today, as well as somewhat dated technology, not able to take care of, uh, take advantage of, excuse me, that newest um, network capability. You know, 5G is a definitely a, sort of a topic that a lot of folks are talking about. But I'm curious, I'm, I'm all about 5G all the time, but I know that most consumers probably vaguely are aware of this term, but don't know the ins and outs. Like, if, from your research, what are you finding in terms of how much people understand in terms of 5G? Because there, there's definitely been a lot of confusion out there. Yeah, there's confusion in the space. You've got it right. And some of that's on purpose, right? Because some carriers market with with interesting terms, in order to gain early market acceptance of the concept of 5G, then things like 5G-E, not really 5G. Yeah, at and um, definitely taking its fair share of criticism for that. Yeah, unfortunately, they caught some lumps on that one. But the cable space, right, the, the landline providers who are also uh, moving into the wireless game, are, are, no, are not without blame here, right, with the 10G moniker. Yes. Who needs 5G when you have 10G, <laughs> which... Which was, you know, I hear you chuckling, and you should, because it's kind of funny when you think about it. Uh, obviously, those are apples and oranges. Uh, they're both fruit and they're both round, but that's where the, the similarities end. 10G is obviously metro Ethernet, yep. right? 10 gigabit Ethernet. Uh, that has nothing to do with, with wireless uh, technologies. So I think there's some FUD, you know, intentional confusion in this space. And then there's also just... Consumers are not necessarily aware of what 5G is. I mean, beyond the technology bubble that you and I live in, it's not the first thing on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. Now, better, faster, not cheaper um, is on many folks' mind all the time. And 5G will be, in fact, better and faster, not necessarily cheaper. There will, of course, be an adder uh, to, to engage, to get that technology or take advantage of those high speeds. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a bit of um, confusion in the space and more investment and building will need to be done on the network infrastructure so that it is seamless and ubiquitous, right? Available everywhere, works inside or outside, uh, not on a particular street corner in Chicago, outside at a, ca at a cafe if you point it at a particular building. Um, so you, you, there needs to be additional seamless, ubiquitous 5G in order for the average consumer to even take notice of it more than, hey, 5G sounds cool. Is that faster? Yeah, for sure. And it's a great point because, I mean, you've seen a bunch of Android phones out there with 5G touting the fact that, you know, they're first to 5G. You know, they're, they're making some groundbreaking devices here. Go, bringing it back to Apple, I mean, do you think it, ultimately it's the right call for Apple to... Uh, you know, hold off on 5G until 2020. Now, I know that, you know, circumstances basically forced Apple's hand into delaying 5G till, till next year, but do you think ultimately that's the right call, given the fact that there still needs to be some maturity that happens with 5G networks? Right, it's, it's the, uh, the availability of the chipset that, that caused them to push it into 2020. Um, you know, the early bird gets the worm, but the second rat gets the cheese. So uh, what I can say is that while being able to see what the market, uh, where the market moves um, by having the, the early movers, named Samsung and LG, go out and, and prove the market for them. Now, the market for faster, better handset is definitely there. The question is, what potholes haven't we seen? And by allowing other manufacturers to step in them first, 
you get to take advantage of, of that map, if you will. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, thinking about it in exacting the maximum amount of revenue at each technological stage or each technological rollout stage, if you, if you look at it that way, actually Apple's taking great advantage of being able to take advantage of those who always have to have the, the biggest, baddest uh, boy on the block, say that 10 times fast. <laughs> and so I, I actually think it's not such a bad move. I think it's quite, it's quite savvy, in fact. Apple, Apple devotees will buy anything with an Apple on it more often than not because they're, they're dedicated to a, um, an, an, infrastructure, well, an infrastructure and a platform that if, you know, just works, right? That's, that's their moniker, it just works. You know, right. It's easy to use, just works. So those that are devoted to it are going to buy it anyway and, and they're going to enjoy it and they're going to love it and they're going to tout it and they, they're going to say that they can't wait for the next one. Well, yeah, and Apple has you know, demonstrated a history of uh, mainstreaming different trends, right? Whether it's making your phone water resistant or adding a fingerprint reader, uh, now making, you know, the notch was a thing that companies were copying for a while. Do you think that's what it's going to take for 5G to go into mainstream awareness, that Apple has to go in, step in, and basically legitimize this technology before, you know, you're basically everyone understands what 5G is? Mm, I don't know if I, if I believe that. Um, and I'll tell you why. Think of the first time, wh what's going to happen in the market, the first time someone ships a television set with an embedded 5G modem. Kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. You've literally cut the cable as opposed to just cord shaving and reducing video services. You can put it on, plug it into an outlet, put it on the wall, and it'll get you know, full, full HD or 4K television. That'll be a, that'll be a major move. Once, once the market starts to taste what um, that full band, that full bandwidth, full wireless bandwidth uh, flavor tastes like, I think we're in for an a real sea change in the market. And I don't know that it just takes Apple coming to market with with a device uh, to do it. Now, do you think that 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 5G TV shows up before a 5G iPhone, or just ask it in a more broader way, like? Right now, all we've seen generally are 5G phones and you know 5G hotspot here and there. Right. We haven't seen a lot of different 5G devices, right? And, and that's ultimately what the promise is of the technology. But do you think some of these other applications, some of these other devices, will be able to take, take advantage of 5G before an Apple 5G iPhone gets here? Mm, likely not. Um, I, I think you're right in terms of coming to market. Apple's 5G iPhone will be here prior to to any of the, the kind of things we were talking about. I think uh, I'll see you at CES in 2021, and we can, we can figure out which, which uh, panel provider has the best 5G television. Thanks, Roger. So now, as always, we turn to our live audience to see which of today's stories they want to learn more about during our live Q&A portion. All right, so BVG, what have we got for today? <laughs> Uh, let's go ahead and jump into the chat and take some great comments and questions that are just flooding in uh, as everybody's joined us here today to get a taste of what's the remnant of uh, Apple's keynote from yesterday. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to say I wish somebody would clap every time I hit the button clicker on a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Tim. Uh, first question, uh, let's take one from Timothy. Do, uh, do you know if the Apple TV Plus that comes with the iPhone if that is transferable. Joan, what's he talking about? Um, I'm not exactly sure what he means by transferable. Um, yeah, because I don't know what would be transferred. <laughs> but uh, maybe this might answer the question. Uh, it is $5 a month for your family, whatever that is. So I guess Oh, you, you could... mean like, can you get, get like a coupon code and you can give it to somebody else to use? You I, I believe that might be the case. <laughs> I don't know. I imagine what happens is that when you activate your device, um, the, the one year free subscription is going to be attached to whatever... Um, Apple ID you use, that's sort of like the activating Apple ID either for your phone or for your Apple TV or iPod Touch or whatever the device it is. So I imagine that it's linked to your um, your Apple ID, your, basically your account, 
with Apple. Um, cause that's also how Apple TV plus is going to charge you just, you know, like, like they do like iTunes and, uh, well, iTunes doesn't exist anymore, but how the app store charges you, it's linked to your, your Apple ID. Uh, also for folks that are interested in this service, obviously you'd be able to watch it on your iPhone. And also if you have an Apple TV device, what other, like if I want to watch it on a big screen, what are the other ways that I could watch it? Uh, well right now, um, as far as we know, it's only... Apple TV and oh, some good. and and some Samsung smart TVs. Seriously? Yeah. So thanks. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to watch it on a mobile phone or on any mobile device, the only options to watch it in an app are iPhones and iPads. You can't watch it on Android phones. You can't watch it on Samsung phones. Um, you can't watch it on Pixels unless you want to stream it via the web. And on big screen TVs, it's either Apple TV or Samsung TVs. Um, now. Apple has promised that it will make its TV app available for Roku's, Fire TVs, and smart TVs from Vizio, LG, and I think maybe one other. Yeah, like everybody else. Yeah. Right, and like well, not big... even like like everybody else. It's table stakes in streaming video to have your product available with an app on Roku everywhere, right. like anywhere that people could pot. Like not only Roku, but like. Gaming consoles are a huge place that people like to stream. So like PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One and all these other streaming, you know, streaming sticks are important that are, you know, maybe made by Google. So, um, yeah, there are some limitations on how you'll actually be able to watch hmm. the service. More questions, please. From SK, uh, we didn't see the new 16-inch MacBook Pro, so will there be an October event for Apple? We also didn't see the rumored iPad Pro either. Short answer, yes. We are expecting an October event. We yeah. don't have any inside knowledge on that, but that has been pretty typical of the company. Usually if they're pretty light on um, some of their uh, PC news or their computer news, then right. they they just move over and do it in an October event. So I would say if you're really dying to find out about you know their, their Mac lineup, just wait another month and we'll probably have another event coming. Yeah. Do we have any timetables for when Apple TV Plus is coming to other devices like the Roku? Good question. Um, Apple has said that it's supposed to happen this year. Um, but so far, I think they made that announcement early in the year, I believe. Um, and so far, they've only made it so far as to get it onto Samsung Smart TVs. And the rest were still waiting. Tim asks, do you know if the codec of those 4K videos are in H.265? If not... The 64 gigabyte storage is definitely not going to be enough. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, but like you're streaming it anyway, right? Yeah, there are downloads available. I don't know the codec, um, but uh, Apple TV Plus will have a download option. Um, they haven't. They haven't. They didn't even specifically say that there will be a download option. It's just what you can deduce from the fact that they said that you'll be able to watch these shows both online and offline. So we don't know much about what downloads are going to entail, really, and we don't know the codec. Hopefully it won't eat up a whole bunch of your phone. Yeah, just buy the most expensive one. Buy the 256 <laughs> gig and then you're going to be fine for like five days. I don't know. Do we know who has the most storage as far as mobiles go right now out there in the market? Obviously, Apple's hovering the pretty median mark right there, uh, dangerously low with the 64. But who who is really like who's got the, the oh, tank out there? OK, so Apple has gone as high as 512 gigs. That was last year's models. I imagine they're going to continue doing that for this year's. Uh, does anybody do a terabyte? Probably. There's probably a Chinese manufacturer that does that. <laughs> Somebody in the chat help me out. I am not a Google is search. Is Roger in the chat? Is yeah. he lurking? Probably. Uh, Ryan asks, LCD screen on the iPhone 11, why wouldn't they upgrade that to an LED screen? Okay. Uh, keep the price down. Even the S10e has an AMOLED screen. So that's a good question. However, I would probably say that people were already buying the 10R. Like they already proved in the market that people were more than happy to buy an iPhone with an LCD screen, even though Samsung and a handful of other phone manufacturers have switched over to OLED for similarly priced devices. So uh, as much as folks that watch this show know that Apple has generally been behind the ball with a yeah. lot of different features and innovations, um, their most hardcore audience, their loyal fans, really don't seem to mind that much. And honestly, the LCD screen is one of the best LCD screens that are out on the market. A lot of reviewers have said that. Um, I personally like the OLED more, but uh, it's 
if you really want an OLED, I guess you could go for a pro version, but it is going to cost you a lot more money. Ryan cites that he does believe that the S10 Plus does have a uh, one terabyte storage drive, and I do believe he's correct with that one. Uh, Jay says, has the, pli- has the price price of the Apple TV Plus changed any of your minds about getting the service? It sold me, plus getting that free next year when I upgrade. Right now, I'm still hovering on that Disney Plus train. That three-year deal was hard to look away from. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, Brian's referring to there was a Disney Plus offer where if you signed up for three years, it lowered the price to basically what the price of Apple TV Plus will be on an ongoing basis. It was about, you could get Disney Plus for like, I think it was like $4.72 if you paid for three years up front. Um, and, you know, yeah, Apple pricing it, there had been reports that Apple was going to price it at 10 bucks a month, which would have been like more than a dollar per title at launch, which... <laughs> So it's wise that they were like, let's slow our roll a little. Pricing it at five dollars makes a lot of sense. And you know, if you want, don't if you're going to be getting it for free, there's nothing to object to. And if you don't mind paying five bucks a month for like eight shows and one movie, all right, yeah, good for you. I was anticipating ten dollars a month. Five dollars does seem cheap. Uh, in the Apple world, but at the same time, the competitive set really forced their hand on this yeah. one. They were going to be shooting themselves in the foot before they even went out yeah. if they were going to do $10 a month. Yeah, I mean, Disney Plus pricing itself standard, its standard price is $7 a month um, without any sort of promotion. And $7 a month is $2 more than what Apple is going to be charging. But Disney Plus is starting with nine original series at launch. So same number as original or as total titles. Like the number of original series on Disney Plus is the entire catalog of <laughs> Apple at launch. Not to mention Disney Plus is going to have literally hundreds of movies and literally thousands of TV episodes. So well, like also, what's the base price on Netflix? And Netflix, Netflix base price. The most popular plan for Netflix is their thirteen dollar plan. They have a nine dollar plan and a sixteen dollar one. But you get the same catalog for each. It's just the matter of like the definition quality of video that you get and the and number of streams, simultaneous yeah. streams that you get. So Netflix charges more than double what Apple's charging, but they have. It's safe to say more than double that they they have more than eighteen titles exponentially. More. Yeah, <laughs> it's safe to say more than eighteen. Like between yes. the date between the date that between the date that Apple TV Plus announced like its details yesterday and the day that it launches, Netflix is going to release thirty two original series or movies or specials. Wow! So like triple the amount that Apple Plus will have. Like that's just in the in the in, in the time, but short time in the two months between like an, less than two months between announcement and launch. Yeah. Whew. Anyway. Very interesting. <laughs> that's a good stat. Yeah. Co-producer Sally has confirmed that the Galaxy Note 10 is expandable up to one terabyte uh, with a uh, SD card, micro makes SD sense. card. So that yeah. does make sense. Thanks, that's Sally. Samsung yeah, those SD cards. Uh, Duran in France is still waiting for Disney Plus and Roku, and that just sparked a thought in my mind. This is one of the first times that the creator is the studio owner, is a streaming service, all in the same hood. In the past, you've seen things like Netflix that you've got to get different distribution rights. Like for us, uh, the one that's closest home is that CBS All Access has produced this Picard show in cooperation with Amazon, but Amazon's distributing it internationally because CBS All Access does not exist internationally. Uh, are there going to be any weird licensing things? Are we going to see different markets see different content from Disney Plus? For Disney Plus or for Apple TV Plus? Let's, let's hit both. Okay, well, for um, the answer for Apple TV Plus is probably going to be simply, every, it'll be available, it'll be like Netflix, where basically, well, I shouldn't say that, that'll make things complicated. It'll be, I presume, since they're not going to have any licensed content, at least that we know about, they are going to be able to have all their originals available in every market at the exact same time. And that's the value of making originals. Yeah. You control the content. Yeah, you have much more control over it. Um, Disney Plus, its originals are going to be available um, everywhere that the service is live. The service is, la- the service is launching in four markets and four countries um, at the beginning, and then it's going to have a progressive rollout worldwide. So as new countries come online, the only thing that's going to be like basically windowing the content is the actual launch of the service in your country. Um, but because they are, they do have this like big back catalog of stuff. There will be instances where in some markets some things aren't available for certain periods of time. Things will maybe go and come back. The idea is that Disney Plus would have 
all of the Star Wars and all of the Marvel and all the Pixar and all the Disney proper stuff that you can think of, but that's not going to be how it is in its entirety. There will be things that come and go. And Disney Plus launches also in November, Yeah, right? November 12th. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> Do you see Google's response to get a new Pixel and free YouTube Premium for six months or maybe YouTube TV for like three months? That could be interesting. Yeah, I think we're all waiting for like more bundles. Yeah. Because right? there are a lot of these new services coming out from, from Apple, Google, Disney. Well, I mean, according to the Chinese calendar, it is the year of the bundle. It's the year of the... It's the year of the bundle, apparently. Sure. <laughs> um, so I don't know. We'll we'll find out if, yeah. if there are going to be more bundles. There's obviously excitement anytime a new bundle does get announced, right? Yeah. And there have been a couple that have been announced Yeah. Um, in the past, what is it, in the past year so far, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Disney is bundling its streaming services together. Um, people are expecting Apple. They were expecting Apple to announce a bundle of its, you know, like Apple Music and its Apple News Plus. Um, and iCloud. Yeah, like they have services that they can package together. Maybe it's something that they're going to save for holiday promotion or who knows exactly. They didn't mention anything about it yesterday. So, so far, no bundles that would include all these Apple services wrapped up together. Let's talk about uh, Google, or sorry, Google, uh, Apple Arcade. Uh, it did right. fly a little bit under the radar yesterday, but they definitely gave it a, a fair fair amount of screen time. Uh, does it compare to Stadia? Is it more like Netflix for games? Uh, was it a promise of 100 games at launch, or are we still kind of weary about that launch library? And finally, was anyone a little passe to that announcement? Gaming isn't my thing, but I do... My understanding is the number was 100. I can't remember if that was actually at launch or if there's going to be some sort of like windowing with that. But the idea is that there would be 100 games to play. Um, also, it's going to be $5 a month, like uh, Apple TV+. Plus. And the idea is, yeah, it's like you sign up and it's it's a game streaming service where there's no kind of bounds to what you can play. You can play, play anything you want for as long as you want. Yeah. They're definitely trying to push that one along with TV Plus and trying to, okay, we, we can't convince you guys to buy a new phone every single year, but maybe we can uh, encourage you to get subscription services and then you've got yeah. kind of that recurring revenue going on. And I think a lot of companies are trying to do that right now, especially Apple, as yeah. they've seen iPhone kind of diminish as being like the big thing that they're doing. Uh, with with arcade, yeah, I'm kind of like Joan. The gaming area is not as much my forte. So, uh, how much more substantial or significant it is compared to Stadia, I don't really know. I was always under the impression that Stadia was a bigger uh, push, but at the same time, Apple's really similar to TV Plus. I believe it's less content, but they're really trying to emphasize, like, look how awesome this is yeah. and look how much work and effort we put into every single one of these games. Uh, we'll see if that works. Yeah. Obviously, that's Apple's play a lot of the time. But, um, yeah, $5 a month, maybe it'll work. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, I'm not so sure it's on a that one. It's the same sort of, like, steep hill to climb where you're going to be launching a service emphasizing quality, um, not quantity, in... A vertical, you know, in an area that you don't have any reputation or like track record, you know, like Apple. I mean, Apple is a provider of, of some of the most popular mobile games in the world, but they've never been like the creator of them. These are also mobile games. This is important to yeah, remember. Yeah, exactly. So this right. Is, these are not Xbox games. These are not PlayStation They're games. All mobile games. These aren't even close, I would argue, to a AAA title. Um, so is that really going to encourage? I, I would love to hear from people on the chat from this is that $5 a month, you're really like, you're agreeing to um, kind of take this journey with Apple that you're gonna be using this on a somewhat regular basis as opposed yeah. to just buying a console game once in a while, whatever. Right. Uh, so is that going to encourage big time gamers to actually go for it? I don't think so. I don't know. No, I don't that's know. The, like, like regular gamers are not gonna go for this. Like people that play a lot of PlayStation or Xbox games. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of casual gamers yeah. might gravitate more to this. And part of the problem, there's also the device support element to it if it's only going to be available it's a mobile i believe it's only going to be available to play on ipads and iphones am i wrong about that i think it's also their like laptops and their computers too. right so, but yeah. not but like if you have an android phone then you're out of luck and 
I think you're right about that. At the same time, like that's what they're trying to do with everything. They're like, just stay in the Apple ecosystem. Yeah, but that doesn't work leave. for content. <laughs> like know. it doesn't, that's not how people like their content. They'd like to be able to play it on what they have. If they want to play it, then they want to play it on what they have. Hmm. All right, we're almost out of time. Let's fly through the last couple here at the end. Why didn't Apple purchase a studio that, that already has IP to increase their content offerings like Sony? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, Apple has always perennially been postulated as being able to buy Netflix because they just have so, Apple has so much money, yeah, more money than God. Money. Yeah. So they could buy anybody. Um, I think part of the reason why they'd rather do it by building it themselves is because A, it's cheaper. And B, you, you're not paying for a bunch of problems that you, you know, like whatever problems that you create when you build it yourself, they're problems of your own making. You're not going to be inheriting any problems from some other legacy company that has business models that you think are tired or outdated. And, and cultures can be different too. We're yeah. seeing that with AT&T. AT&T is a really great example. Yeah. Just to put on my old Wall Street Journal cap here for a second, there's an activist investor that's going after AT&T right now saying, hey, you just gobbled up Time Warner for a ton of of money after gobbling up direct tv for a ton of money right so what like like show me the money how are you actually you know successfully doing that so there's always this argument that yeah apple is has this huge cash pile why don't they just buy something well it's not that simple you know i you mean can, it could be it could, <laughs> they be, could but you have cultural differences like yeah. like corporate cultural differences yeah and a handful of variety of other things. I really like what you said too, as far as like you're inheriting a lot of problems or a lot of, you know, um, just skeletons in the closet that you're yeah. getting from other companies. Yeah. So uh, it's it's not that simple. And therefore, Apple just decided to just kind of grab a bunch of, try to do this more in the independent way. And because Apple is Apple, they got some of the biggest names in entertainment. Yeah. They got Oprah, they got Spielberg involved. Like those are. J.J. Abrams. Nothing to sneeze yeah. at. Like those are huge, huge names. Those yeah. are those are some of the top top tier talent out there. So um, they're they're not having a problem getting their foot in the door, obviously, yeah. because they do have a very big checkbook. Yeah, because they have a huge checkbook. They can shower money on people, and they also have the. I mean, they have the cachet. Apple is like a very sleek, premium company, and and it's trusted as a brand. So like that works for Hollywood talent and Hollywood creators as much as it does for consumers like there's a there's an aura around apple so having lots of money and having an aura of being like super slick and cool helps even if you want to make ridiculously expensive television shows <laughs> yeah closing thoughts what were your favorite announcements from the event yesterday and what were your favorite colors of the new phone? Uh, that that like purple that doesn't really look like purple. I guess that's my favorite color because I haven't really seen that one before. Was it Google that has the pink color that they call not pink? Not pink. Why yeah. did I mean? Yeah, so it's like this incredibly pale pink. That being said, like the colors are so unimportant to me because you always put them in a case anyway. It's just kind right. of like who cares about the colors? Right. Oh, but they um, were warming up yesterday trying to make it sound like you don't need to caseify this this yeah, round. Yeah, they were like, I oh, know. if you want a case. Here are some cases. I'm like, of course, I'm putting a case on a thousand dollar phone. Are you out of your mind? Um, the most interesting announcement it goes back to exactly what we said earlier on the show, which was the seven hundred dollar price uh, tag yeah. on on the iPhone 11. I think that speaks volumes to where we are with Apple right now. And unfortunately, I think we're also going to have to wait and see for 2020. Uh, I feel like we say this a lot. But maybe next year will be better. Maybe next year will be more interesting as far as like a 5G yeah. iPhone or something that's a little bit more innovative. Yeah. I mean, my my take is a cop out, which is like I thought the most interesting announcements were the things they didn't talk about, which is like there's not going to be 5G, which I think that anybody that's going to invest $1,000 or even $700 in a phone, considering people don't update every single year anymore. You want a future proof. You for want at a least future proof. Yeah. yeah, and like 5G is going to be coming up fast. Like they didn't nothing about folding or any sort because of course they wouldn't. Like that's so they're not going to touch that until the market's like, oh yeah, 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 we love that. We'll we'll we'll, we'll gobble that up from you. And they're like, okay, here you go. Um, <laughs> Joan, you're on fire with impressions today. Oh, that, you think my my Apple impression is on point? Yes. I've been working really hard on it. Thanks. Uh -huh. I enjoyed it. It's a little <laughs> bit of the shades of goofy in there. So that's pretty good. <laughs> 
That's the market. <laughs> what else didn't they talk about? I don't know. There's a lot. There's, There's a lot. lot. There's, There's more a lot that they missing. didn't talk about. My, my, my most interesting thing from yesterday's event was what wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, I wish they had said something about the Apple Card, too. They just announced the Apple Card in late August. Right. I was hoping they would at least say something. Granted, I was on the hook to write about the Apple Card, so maybe I'm just <laughs> mad that you know I didn't get to write about it. But anyway, yeah. uh, we'll we'll see. That's another one of those services or those new things that they're really trying to push as they expand out of the iPhone. So yeah, yeah. I'm gonna side with the audience on this one. I like the Expedition Green as well. Um, I don't know. Is that the light green or the dark green? I for think the that's Pro? the dark green, isn't it? The dark. Like the foresty so green. I thought the green looked sharp, but I like to call it green. Uh, people were disappointed with the lack of 5G and lack of wireless charging. Well, the wireless charging has been right. the ongoing right. curse. The 5G, I don't know. I couldn't care less. I think Apple might be just playing it safe and not jumping too early on into untreaded waters. I mean, it's it's coming one way or another. Uh, we're all just kind of like circling that carcass right now to see where it takes us. <laughs> um, the 5G carcass? Yes. <laughs> sure. Because it's already dead because they're already it's a great on image. 6G. Uh, Wait, I have to hit the hype button. <laughs> That's right. So one more before Anytime, we uh, let everybody go. Michael Brown wants to know if we believe, and just put your analyst cap on for this one, not our personal feelings, do we think the market is going to respond by uh, having the iPhone 11 or Pro being the most popular smartphones of 2019, 2020? Why or why not? Hmm. In the entire marketplace? Are we talking global marketplace or US marketplace? I think I, I, I feel really confident that this is gonna be a better sales year for iPhone than the last one was. I think that's generally true when we're talking about the kind of new, like whatever like you call it, like the 11s versus the, like when it's not intergenerational years, those are always a little bit down. The half this years, a, yeah. yeah. the half years. This is a new generation year. And it also by lowering that price point, I think is gonna spur a lot more unit sales um, for the main phone that people are gonna be going after. I think there's maybe a little bit of pent up demand. And so I think it's gonna be a really strong year for the iPhone proper. As to whether it's gonna beat out other phones worldwide, in the U.S., I don't know. I'm not really good at that. I'd have to look of, at you know yeah. existing data. I think Samsung is way ahead. Um, I think Huawei has been way ahead as far as like actual total unit sales. But don't take that to the bank, please. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure with that. But I agree with everything you said as far as that. Um, this is probably going to be a better year from them. Um, they they always make tons of money off of the iPhone, and this won't be any different. Yeah. Maybe they're going to be able to stabilize the business off of this, but at the same time, I think a lot of consumers are going to wait and they're going to wait for that 5G phone, which yeah. if Apple knows what it's doing, it is going to prepare for next September. You know, so we'll see when that happens. Yeah. Shout out to Ayaz who points out that the green color is actually titled Midnight Green. My yeah, bad. that's what I thought. I thought Expedition Green sounded right. But honestly, yesterday <laughs> was such a blur that I don't even know anymore. Expedition Green sounds cooler, though. You got to give me that much, right? It's whatever. I'm also, uh, we can call it Expedition Green, just like we called it the iPhone X for way too long. <laughs> and thank God we're thank not God. saying. Thank God. It's not iPhone XI Pro Max. Wait, I don't even, I don't oh. even know. Oh, I'm going to fall off my chair. That's so horrible. <laughs> That's my biggest applause to yesterday is that they finally cleaned up the naming convention. Yes. Good yeah. job, Apple. It's, I mean, it was just a mess. 10R X. It's just so stupid. Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> All right, it's time for us to go. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. We'll be back one more time tomorrow. Maybe a little more Apple chatter. Maybe not. We'll see. Uh, but anyways, thanks for putting up with us. I hope we uh, entertained you, recapped well enough. I'm sure this conversation will be ongoing for a while. And I hope if anybody jumped on to the actual live stream, live stream yesterday, enjoyed Bridget and Ayaz and Mr. Bacalar chattering for three and a half hours straight. What troopers that they had to keep their butts planted there and watch that stream. My butt is still numb. Because I had to sit here and push the button through the entire thing. Right, Sally? Yeah. So thanks again, everybody. Ben, go ahead and send us home. Okay. Before we wrap things up, we want to remind viewers and listeners that there is one day left for our contest to win a Hasbro <laughs> Cubby Robotic Stuffed Bear. Just uh, click on through to CNET.com slash giveaway. Try to get that robot bear, people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for all your questions and keep sounding off here and in the comments or at us on Twitter. And while you're at it, go ahead and throw us a like and ring the bell so you can catch us here on YouTube, Periscope, and CNET.com slash Daily Charge. We're here live weekday mornings at 11.15 a.m. 
Eastern time. Uh, links to today's headlines are, what are you laughing at? Links to today's headlines are in the description below. Also, the audio podcast is available everywhere. Fine podcasts are available for the Daily Charge. I'm Ben Fox Rubin. I'm Joni Salzer. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. <laughs>